when mm-hmm. you talk about art, there's a lot of people out there, a lot, a lot of kids, especially kids, because it reminds me of when I was a kid, yeah. that potentially could be very good artists, and they get thrown by the wayside because they don't have support, they don't have either family or school support, or they yeah. don't have the funds. Right. Which was my problem when I was growing up. We were so poor, I couldn't afford pencils. <laughs> wow. Yeah. <laughs> so it was crazy. Yeah. But I found a way to draw them on paper sacks and all that. So that's, awesome. That's what I did. So. Oh, my gosh. This is going to be so good. Welcome to In the Act, a radio program on process and the creative life. Creativity does not just start and stop with artists. We all make aesthetic or guiding decisions. Our aim is to talk through the process and investigate how we choose to express ourselves and to live creatively. And we're connecting with people about their lives. That's the subject of our show. Broadcasting in the studio from Mead Public Library in Sheboygan, Wisconsin, I am Erica Hunsinger, and this is In the Act. Today's guest is an artist, graduated with a B.A., is, was a lawyer, was the former mayor of Sheboygan, <laughs> paints every day now, returned right. to being an artist. Juan Perez, thank you. Well, thank you for having me, Erica. That's so it's great. A, it's a wonderful idea, as I was mentioning earlier, that uh, it, it, it's a great way to, to get a, a full, or, or if not a full, a partial taste of what Sheboygan is all about in the whole area, and in fact, Wisconsin. Absolutely. So yeah. Uh, you uh, you mentioned creativity in all aspects of life, um, and that's it's very perceptive of you because you see it out there, and a lot of people don't necessarily recognize it as being creative or or or, or it being create creative, um, but they put a lot of energy into it. They put a lot of heart, and for me, when they, when I see that kind of passion in anything, uh, I admire it. Absolutely, and, and, and it uh, motivates me to to even create more on my part. Yeah. My part in creating is, at this point at least, is art. Yeah. Um, and I read your bio uh, on your website, and it said that you returned to it after like 34 years or something. <laughs> and so, it's, and you had mentioned earlier, like, how did you, you started drawing and creating? And well, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it was interesting because as a kid, I was, I think I was about eight years old when I picked up, actually picked up a pencil, a broken pencil and a paper sack and started drawing. And, and my friends and my, even some of my family would say, yeah, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. So it kind of motivated me to keep doing it. Sure. And as I went through junior high and high school, other people would tell me, hey, you're pretty good, you're pretty good. Uh, when I was in high school, I was actually uh, had the opportunity to be, uh, to, to be uh, awarded a full four-year full scholarship at West Texas State, but I turned it down. Wow. And I don't know why I turned it down, but in some respects, I'm glad because I wouldn't have met my wife. I wouldn't have the kids I have. Right, <laughs> I mean, yeah. Life takes you in different forks. So after that, I went to junior college and... I took one art class and it didn't work out well because that at that time and uh, now I hear it's not that way any, anymore, which is good. But the professor would come in and says, "We're going to paint this today. I'll be back later," and that's it. Right. So you, you, for that, you don't need a course. You can just do it yourself. So we kind of—I was always the, the one that uh, would kind of be challenging people, and so I challenged a professor, and he wasn't very happy with me. Yeah, so right. I never took another art class in my life again. So basically, I consider myself self-taught, self-taught, uh, and just by observing and watching, yeah. looking at other people's art, and just doing what I feel that I need to do. That's and amazing. It, it's hard for people to understand that when you're passionate about something, and it sounds cliche, it sounds, nah, it's not that, that can't be it. But when you're passionate, you, you can't help yourself. You have to paint. You have to. I mean, I, I have dreams in my in, at, at night, and I wake up and I sketch. Wow. And and, I, and then I paint. Uh, and people say, "Oh, that's that's baloney." Well, that's okay. Whatever people want to think, but I know that, right. that that's me. I mean, that's what I do. So yeah. That's how I express my creativity and and art. Yeah. Basically, my my favorite subject is people. I like to I like to paint people. And I have this habit, and my wife's always after me. I have this habit of staring at people. But I'm not staring for any obscene or any rude uh, reason. I just like to see features. I like to see how their nose is shaped or their cheeks, the light hitting a certain spot in the face yeah. or, the, or the back or the arm. Uh, 
And sometimes it's got to be in trouble. <laughs> Funny. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's the nature of the artist, too. It's like that. Um, uh, I mean, you're taking time to explore the things that are important to you and making space for that and making it a forefront of your life right now. And that's a that's what, you know, fine artists do. That's what artists do. Mm-hmm. That's what poets and, you know, <laughs> people do to kind of refine what's important to you and to follow that path. And it's a shame sometimes, at least in my part, that it took so long to really just, now that I'm retired, I do what I want to do. And I've been financially lucky enough that I can afford whatever I want. Right. I mean, I'm not a multimillionaire, but I, I can afford things that I couldn't afford back then. And after I got out of junior college, I actually got married at 21. And so from that point on, I did a little bit more artwork here and there, and then I got busy going to college and having kids and raising a family. So for 30-something years, I did nothing. Art played no part in my life. And when I retired, I asked my wife, I said, I wonder if I can still paint and draw. And she said, well, you always could. Yeah. I said, I think I'm going to try again. So I started messing around with it, and uh, it just got me again. It it hooked me. And and that's that passion that came back. And was reignited, and it got me going again. And then I started putting stuff on Facebook, and people started liking it. And now I get all kinds of commissions and sold some of my work, which is pretty cool. That's awesome. Sure. I I don't paint to sell, and I don't mean that to offend any artist because there are artists that paint to sell, and that's their livelihood. But I don't paint to sell. So if Mm -hmm. it sells, it's great. It's good for the ego. If nothing, if I don't sell, it's okay, too. I'm still going to paint. Absolutely. (laughs) Every day. And I think that's the – I mean, I – Maybe I'm a little biased on this, but I do think that that's the true artist talking of painting or creating because there's a need or a passion and a want to have that uh, expression realized uh, as opposed to painting for someone else to then get paid for it. it it's, and it's it's not that it's a bad thing. And yeah, <laughs> it's good for the ego, but um, but it changes how you create then if you're reliant on someone else's money to create. It's a, it's a different thing, I think. And someone but, else's approval after it's right. completed. Uh, and it's it's very hard to to explain to people that when you're painting for yourself, you kind of really completely let yourself go. Yes, come out as it comes out but when you have a commission there's certain expectations that you can't avoid uh that right. that are there and and, and they're just there and there's yeah. people that are going to pay you 500 bucks or whatever to do a portrait and there's certain expectations they have so you kind of have to compromise <laughs> yes <laughs> you know and uh, it's not bad yeah but it's still not Totally you in the, in the way you want to be. Right. It's a collaboration of self, of like self with other in some ways. And one of the things I've learned too that, I mean, at least I've tried to learn is that uh, an artist for me should not lock himself in a certain style or certain colors. And that for, the, for many years has been taught that that's good. And I'm sure it's good. It probably is, will continue to be good. But I, I believe in versatility. You know, yeah. I believe in being realistic. I believe in being kind of impressionistic. I, I believe in just painting the way you feel like painting. Right. Um, and I've been told, well, you're so versatile. You, don't, you, you have no, no distinct pattern or color pattern. And, well, that's just me. Yeah. <laughs> that's just the way it is. Yeah. And I understand that as a focal point. Um. For people to recognize your work or something like that. But the explorations that humans have are diverse and and multi-layered, multi-tiered, and we're dynamic beings. And to sit within just one color palette or one particular style sometimes um, disallows for play. And for experimentation right. to uh, inform uh, the work that you do th- that does feel like of you, you know? Mm-hmm. And uh, 
You have a pretty unique style yourself. I, I, I admire that. In fact, you, I think Thanks. you had some uh, display in Chicago lately or something. Right, like yes. That. Well, congratulations yep. again. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> it's got to be exciting. Yeah, I, d- I mean, I, a totally different, I lived in uh, Chicago for a people. while. People. Yeah. Okay. yeah. And uh, you've got how many pieces now? Um, up there, I have 30. 30? Oh, wow. Yeah, I know. I didn't realize there was that many. It's a lot of, been a busy. Lot of pieces. Been busy. Yeah, I have a few in town, too. So um, it's, um, I think during um, the pandemic, I had a, a solo show that was scheduled at a gallery in Chicago, and um, it was canceled. Oh, okay. Uh, it was for March through I think it was like March, April, or maybe the beginning of May um, in 2020. And that's when everything shut down. The world, you know, came to its knees uh, right. with this virus. And um, so then I had prepped all of these pieces, and they were ready for the show, and they just sat in my uh, studio. Um, but I found solace in my studio um, for the first time, because I actually, and this may, I, and I want to get into this with you, is I don't actually enjoy the process of painting. Oh, really? I don't. I <laughs> really am drawn to the product and what happens. The and if I product. can break, yeah, and yeah. if I can break through some mysterious, I have no idea what it is, and <laughs> come to a place where I'm like, oh, I like that. That feels okay. And I think you talk about it in your bio, too, is that um, if you can get to satisfaction, if it if satisfaction was a word that you mm-hmm. used mm-hmm. and um and so i tried to find um like spaces and times and pieces that uh that i could fully express myself it wasn't for anybody else but me because there wasn't any shows coming up mm. um i didn't know what the what our our collective lives looked like at that time and so um i poured into that um, and, and that for, space. For me, it's a, going from where you're you're talking. It's, it's, yes. it's easier for to paint in your own style, for whatever that may be, yep. than to try to imitate other artists. I know I've heard other artists say, "Oh, I want to paint like him. I want to paint like this guy." Yeah. I don't. I just want to paint. Yes. And if it kind of looks that way, it's it's fortuitous because it, I mean it's, it's just by chance. Right. Uh, but I, I think that when you try to paint like another artist. You're not only you're compromising, but you're sacrificing your own style, your own inspiration. Yeah. No, it, it's no longer you. <laughs> you're right. trying to imitate. I've heard some people. I want to paint like Vincent Van Gogh. First of all, you can't. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. There's no way you're going to behave. Right. To. I mean, I, I love Van Gogh. I love yes. the impressionist. Yes. I could never paint that way. Yeah. I'd, be, I'd drive me nuts. Yeah. Because I'm realist. Right. I, and and I, w- I would never leave a face with a little brush stroke. I mean, right. I'd want to paint the eyelashes and everything. Right. So it drives me nuts. But I love the art. I love Van Gogh's, Zahn, Renoir. Right. I love all those guys. I love yeah. their art. I, I study them. I look at them all the time, and I yeah. read upon them. I read on them. Um, but there are people that I hear out there say, oh, I wish I could paint this way. And one guy came to me one time and was tapping on my window. And he says, <laughs> you know, would you mind if I watch you paint? I said, sure, come on in. And he yeah. watched. He said, well, you would teach me. I said, I can show you. I'm not a teacher. I've never taught. No, I've never been taught, so I've never taught. So you can watch me and you can ask questions and I said, but I want to learn how to paint like you. And that's what got me. I said, no, you don't paint like me. You're going to have to learn to paint like yourself and right. hopefully better than me. Otherwise, you know, it's like old Da Vinci used to say, poor is a pupil who does not surpass his master. Wow. You know, you, yeah. you have to, why are you being taught if that's, if that's your, your end point? Right. You have to go beyond that. You right. Have to, and for me, I'm, I'm a crazy guy. I set goals that are too high to attain. Simple as that. If, if I re- for, I think if for most people, it's not that they set their goals and never reach them. They set their goals and reach them too quick, and they don't know what else to do. So my goals are always beyond my capabilities, beyond my ability. So I never reach them. It keeps me going. It keeps, wow. me, it keeps me driving. Oh, for sure. So Yeah. And for for that, I've been called crazy, but that's okay. <laughs> that's okay. And it's it's really hard to, I mean, good for you to to recognize that you can just brush those off and have a, a strong sense of self to be able to do that because it does kind of get into your craw a little bit sometimes I think but it does for me anyway yeah. but um, but that's really inspiring yeah. and I you know thing some sometimes I think that um, 
that it is important to try on different jackets, you know, to try like that experimentation and play. Mm -hmm. Like you can try to paint like Van Gogh to see what it might feel like to paint like that, you know, to try on these different, you know, there's like in in art school, I think we had to paint like one of the old ma- like Flemish masters, and it was very difficult for me because that is not my style at all. But I learned technique and tried to understand a different way of thinking, and that sort of expansion I think is really interesting. But it's not going to lead me down the path to paint like them. Mm-hmm. It just teaches <clears throat> me new things for how I need to paint, and that sounds like the approach in which you were taking and you take is like looking at drawing from incorporating and then, but it's all coming out through your fingertips, through right. your vision, through what is right for you. Now, at some point, maybe you do kind of, you, you are, uh, uh, you do pick up some of how or what they do, but it's not because you're trying to imitate them. It's right. just because just kind of, it goes well with your with your technique, with your passion, with your way of painting. Uh, well, you, you kind of do that like he does. You kinda, well, it's not because I'm trying to imitate anybody. It's because it's just, it's inspiring. I see that and I like it. And so I, you know, I just paint. Right. Um, but that's that's the beauty. A lot of a lot of people. I, I tell people go to museums. Go to museums. Yeah. You learn a lot. I mean, I, yes. I'll sit there and stare for at a, at a painting for an hour yeah. just to watch the brush strokes, just to watch the color tones, just to watch that blending, if any. Yeah. Uh, the sharp edges, the smooth edges. I, yeah. I watch all that. Uh, nobody taught me that. It's just I want to see it. And, yes. and you can Some of these paintings, like Van Gogh, when they had the ex- exhibition in, at uh, Chicago Art Institute, which we're members of, when, when they had the three bedrooms, you could, yeah. you could almost... I mean, it, it was a, almost a different angle of each, you know. And and the funny thing is, to me anyway, <laughs> is that everybody tries to explain what Van Gogh did and why he was doing. It. Nobody knows. You yeah. can only speculate. Right. I mean, Van Gogh would probably be laughing and rolling his grave, saying, "That's not what I wanted." <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> What's wrong with you? <laughs> well, why did you put my painting on an umbrella? <laughs> so, and, and when you see, for for example, his portrait that's still there at the <laughs> institute. Yeah. You know why a painting is great. That thing just talks to you. It just jumps at you. It just it like pulsates, and just it's it's it, the paint. It it's just it's that feeling you get when when you see a, a a good painting. There's a lot of artists, and there's a lot of good artists. Yeah. And there's a lot of great artists, but they don't come around that often. Yeah. And you know, we had the the the, uh, the luck that we can actually enjoy Van Gogh and Cezanne and Renoir. And, yeah. Uh, I just I just love those guys. Yeah. You know. I love that. Welcome back. We're here with Juan Perez in on in the act. Yeah, a lot of a lot of people. I shouldn't say a lot, but some people tell me that. How, how do you manage to paint every single day? Which I do, and I don't even think about it. I just it's like I have to. It's, it's me, you know, and. They say, well, how do you know what to paint? You know, I have a hard time deciding what to paint. Mm-hmm. I just paint. You know, I mean, if, if I need to paint, I see a table, I'm going to start messing around with it. Yeah. And one of the things I've learned is not to throw anything away. My son got mad at me because I threw some drawings away in the dumpster. <laughs> and, oh, I don't be throwing anything away anymore. <laughs> so, right. So I don't throw anything away. But I'm also notorious for reworking paintings. Yeah. And I, I saw a painting that I had there that I did two years ago, and... I kind of thought it could look better, so I started messing around with it again. And yeah. sometimes I make notations in the back because somebody will say, oh, somebody reworked this. Well, it was me that did it. The right. Artist, you know. So I, I'm kind of bad with that, but it's just that sometimes after a year or two or a month or two months or whatever, you, you kind of see it see it differently. Mm-hmm. You kind of like maybe I could have done better with it. Like maybe it doesn't quite fit me. Yeah. And I've been told an artist, once you're done, you leave it. Don't mess with it. 
as I say all the time, I set my own standards. Absolutely. <laughs> I don't abide by anybody's standards, right. which is crazy, but you know, you're nuts. I mean, that's what – that's, I think, what – the guiding force should be, though, um, is that you're – I know plenty of artists that repaint their work, and the rules that are set are are to be discarded, really. There are not any rules. And you're – by you kind of saying, yep, got it, heard it, not doing that is really paving your own way. And, you know, not to be arrogant, but who sets those rules and who sets those standards? I have no idea. why are we bound to abide by those rules and those standards when you could be beyond those? Yeah. So you're actually not only compromising, but you're locking yourself into a box that you can't get out of. Yeah. And that's not a good feeling, I'll tell you. (laughs) No, it's not. Nobody likes to have those constraints. Uh, Well, I don't know. Maybe some people do, but I personally don't. Mm-hmm. Like like in watercolor, like you're supposed to leave white, sort of like backwards painting, like leave white mm-hmm. and then add yellow and add your bright colors first and then deepen as you go. And I, mm-hmm. I, you, I watercolor a lot, and that's not how – I don't take a particular rule approach. I would drive all those people nuts. You're not supposed to do that. <laughs> yeah. I'm not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that's good. It's good for expansion and exploration. Would you tell uh, our listeners to a little bit um, – about your process, like what kind of paint do you use? Um, Primarily oils. I've, okay. I've done quite a few acrylics, and I do some watercolor. Uh, I'm not. I, I like watercolor, but it's just not me. Yeah. But it's good for me to do it because it kind of gives me another another outlook on on on, on, the, on a particular painting or so, and so forth. Sometimes I do a watercolor and an oil. Yeah. And I try to do the same thing. But primarily oils. And my process is kind of goofy. Um, I layer a lot of paint. I yeah. Most of my paintings, my portraits in particular, have 7 to 10, 12 layers of paint. Wow. And I glaze a lot. Uh, why I do it? Because what I want the end product to be is what drives me to be do to be add more layers of paint. If I don't like the way it looks, I put more paint on it. Right. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Which I do a lot. Um, so I use a lot of I, I primarily use oils. Uh brushes I go through brushes like crazy because I don't I'm not gentle with my brushes I'm yeah. pretty rough with them so, yeah so they just go on the, and there again I was throwing them away my son said don't throw them away put them in a box so I have this box full of brushes <laughs> and you know brushes are not cheap no I know I'm the same way I know <laughs> they're not cheap but I go you know those little bristles they, they fall off the sables they just wear away yeah I, I use them and I have no particular method of applying paint other than if the brush does not whole paint correctly and I I don't like it you know yeah but again you can't find the perfect brush either yeah so I, I use a lot of small brushes uh, some, some little bigger ones flat ones and, and, and uh, little, little pointed ones uh, I, I paint primarily on canvas I stretch my own canvases oh you do wow uh, and I have a lot of oil old frames 100 year old frames 150 year old frames and those are the ones I use for for our portraits, family, because my house is full of stuff now. Wow. Uh, so if I buy, for example, the standard 16 by 20, 8 by 10, whatever they sell them, wherever they sell the canvases, uh, some of these old frames don't fit those standard, what's standard size now. Oh. So I stretch my own canvases. I make my own frames and I stretch my own canvases. And so I, you're building I, your own frames as well? No, no. I, I stretch the canvas to fit the old frame because you can't find a canvas Right in the market that fits the old frame because the old frame wasn't wasn't constructed for any standard size. Right, I meant the wooden stretcher bars. Oh, oh yes, oh yes. But I you're mean, building oh, sure, those. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Well, I have my table saw and my miter saw and all that kind of stuff. But I have all this stuff too wow. because in the morning, for example, from ten to two, we do restoration. We restore antique furniture. My wife and I decided to do that when I retired. Wow. In fact, I did all these chairs that are up there, those Phoenix chair co- uh, chair companies' chairs that are up there and the tables. Oh, wow. I refurbished them a long time ago. Oh, my for gosh. Sure, for sure. And so in the mornings, we do that. We do we restore antique furniture and modern stuff. I mean, we do all the upholstery. I do all the strip and refinishing. Oh, my goodness. We manufacture parts for tables that are missing a leg or an apron or whatever. 
So we do that. So I have all the tools that I need on top of that. So I just sit, use them for building my own, stretch my own frames that's and so amazing. forth. That's amazing. I mean, that's a transformative process in and of itself. It's like taking something that is damaged or old or has worn in some ways and giving it back its life in some ways. And that's a really beautiful metaphor that you start your days And people together. have called me an artist because of that. Because of when course. they bring me a before uh, – piece of furniture and when they see it and some of them literally cry they say oh i can't believe it came out this nice and oh. what i did too is when i was doing this i started studying and this is just self-imposed i started studying construction yeah and and, and, and furniture so I, I if i wanted to i could make it too but i don't want to make it because i don't want to buy other tools that i really don't need for something <laughs> right <laughs> now i'm not invested in, in, in something that i'm not going to get the full use of so but I, I have all the tools that I need. We do all the restoration. We've done uh, a lot of work for, uh, for for Sheboygan area and Milwaukee. We do some for Green Bay, Manitowoc, wow. Cedarburg. Those are some big projects. And we awesome. just got done doing um, almost 60 chairs for the American Club. Wow. Uh, so And that, that was a, hard, a little hard of a project uh, because... They need the chairs back at a certain time, so you have, sure. to, you have to meet deadlines. Right. And you have to work hard. Yeah. Uh, but uh, it got done, and then we move on. So, I'm struck sitting here right now that you have all of these, like, iterations of your life. Like, you were, <laughs> like, you got a B.A., and then I'm, how did you get, how did you get from a B.A. to law school, and then transform into becoming a mayor and then going back to painting and then have a restoration business. Like <laughs> these are amazing uh, explorations of your life, of who you are. And, and I, I have this, what I call a sickness, but <laughs> I, I, I can't sit still. I have to be doing something. Yeah. And uh, I'm not very good at watching TV for a long time because you got to get up and do something. Sure. And everybody says, well, I'm, I'm everybody's multitask, but I'm doing two or three times, thinking at the same time most of the time. You know, I'm just moving around. Yeah. I'm gluing the furniture over here. I'm doing a poster here. When I'm doing that, I'm, I'm gessoing a frame or yeah. stretching something or just going from different angles. And my kids are always telling me, Dad, slow down. <laughs> I can't. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, I, I think, how do you slow down when you, you don't know how? Sure. So, uh, yeah. But yeah, it, it's been it's been a, a pretty good life. Uh, had the ups and downs. Uh, what was your, how how did you go from, art, at BA, to lawyer? What was that trajectory like? What was your choice thinking? What motivated me? Or? Um, yeah. Because you seem motivated by your passions. And so what was it about law that drew you? I, 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 you know, this may not sound plausible at all, but it was just a challenge that, yeah. that, I, that I saw that I wanted, I wanted to, to go to law school. Um, and I think I've kind of um, passed it on genetically to my kids. They're, they're kind of the same way, you know. Yeah, uh, they they're, they're driven. They're driven, and and I've always been a, a person that's that's been driven by what I don't know. But there's certain things that if I decide to do, then I want to do. Uh, I don't accomplish them. That's okay. It keeps me going. It it keeps me going to towards reaching that goal if I ever do. Right. Uh, but you know, I mean, I went to, to I got married. We had a child a year and three months later. And it was rough. It was rough. It was even rough before when, before I got married because my mom died when I was nine years old. My gosh. She left nine kids behind. Oh, my gosh. Uh, the baby that was born when she died uh, was raised by my sister. She had to quit school, middle school, to raise her. And wow. that baby, who's a sister, still calls her sister mom, even though she's been told that's not your mom. She still right. calls her mom because she raised her. And my dad was... Illiterate. He, I think, he went to second grade. He was a, a farm hand, yeah, uh, a laborer, and he made twenty-two bucks a week wow. for nine kids. We had a two little bedroom house, a little living room, a kitchen. Most of the kids slept on the floor, dirt floors. 
uh, one room had a, ca a canvas on top when it rained, when it didn't, it took it off. Wow. Uh, sometimes you had something to eat, sometimes you had nothing to eat, just the way it was. Yeah. You know, and I, I never realized that I was poor until I was told I was poor. I was always happy. Sure. <laughs> yep. And right. then somebody told me, you know, you guys are pretty poor. And I'm starting wondering, what is poor? And I guess I realized what it was. But maybe that's what drives me. I don't know. It just drives me and drives me and drives me. And, for example, I like when we were growing up, my, my mother had this chair. Huh. And from what I know about furniture now, it was a mission chair, mission style. Uh, uh, and it was actually, a, would have been a rocker because it said, too low to the ground, and if it had the rockers, it would have been jacked up a little bit. Okay. But that was her chair. Yeah. Nobody sat on that chair unless she sat on that chair, and you could sit on her lap. And it, it was not a fear; it was respect. Yeah. Kind of like when they say, "When your dad said sit down, you don't look for a chair; you just sit." You know, it's respect; it's not yeah. fear. So my mom had this chair. I'd pay a lot of money for that chair if I had it, because that's the only thing that rem really reminds me of her. That I don't have a lot of memories. I have a few memories. Some are very vivid, but the rest is just blank because I was too young. Yeah. And I wish I had that. So I, the point I'm trying to make and where I'm going is that for some reason, I'm probably the only one in the family that, that, had, that likes antique furniture. And my house is full of it. Yeah. It's uh and being able to buy and sell antique furniture, I get to keep what I want, so I get to keep the best. Right. <laughs> <laughs> we don't clutter, but yeah. we decorate and we we put enough out there that that it looks good. Yeah. yeah. So, and we do the in Victorian style. Oh, nice. Yeah, and our house has got the first floor's 10-foot ceilings, so wow. we'll put that. You know where I live, right? I don't think I do. Right here across the street in the White House with the lions. Oh, yeah. I love those. <laughs> oh, cool. Yeah. When we put those yeah. lions up there, we brought them in a tow truck. So, and people oh started gosh. stopping by taking pictures. And <gasps> even awesome. now, people go by. Do you mind if we take pictures with the kids on the lions? Go yeah. ahead. You know, don't oh, ask me that's go great. Yeah, so that's pretty cool. But I had smaller ones, and they kept trying to steal them. Oh, gosh. And, uh, yeah. And then a friend of mine was somewhere up in Beloit or something. He called me and he said, hey, there's, there's two big lions over here. I said, really? How big? He said, they're huge. Said, like five feet by three feet high or something like that. So I said, holy cow. I said, I'm going to go look at them. So I went up there and uh, I struck a deal with the guy and I bought them, brought them back and had them put up. That's so great. <laughs> and were you particularly looking for lions? That's or? my protector, the lion. Tell in me about house, that. You, in my house, you walk in, there's lions everywhere. Oh, uh, uh, uh. my, um, my ring, is... which I can't wear now because my finger got too, too uh, thick, uh, <laughs> is a, a lion with three little diamonds on it. So. Wow! So, and I always like lions. Uh, in fact, I like all kinds of animals. I uh, I spend a lot of money feeding animals all year. So my wife thinks I'm crazy, but that's okay. Wow! Cats, dogs, a few dogs, a lot of cats, crows, squirrels. Wow! You befriended cool. crows too. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, you hear these stories about how they like shiny objects. Yeah. And uh, there's a lot of truth to that because I, I feed them every day and they call. And I feed them dog food because they like the little morsels, you know. Oh. And uh, so they're up there and they're calling and calling. So I go up there and, I throw little, <laughs> and they come down. And they, I mean, they're, they're not real close to me, but they're, they're getting closer and closer through the years. I've been doing it for years. Oh, my gosh. And one time I was out, I was in my studio, I was looking out the window the door, the window in the door, and I saw this girl land in the, in the back door of my uh, my workshop. I said, what the hell was that? And I saw her drop something, so I go up there, and it was this ring. She brought a ring. And people said, come on, that's, 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 that's bull, that's BS. It really happened. That's it's a little so shiny. Cool. I don't even know if it's sterling, but it's still, I still have it. And, and and then I put it on Facebook. I said, what, what, what is this about? They and people started sense. saying, they, they do that. Crows will do that. And I wow. thought it was bizarre. but <laughs> That's so great. That's like, thank you from the crows. Something like that, yeah. I love that. And we had this little cat there and a squirrel. <laughs> We're getting off the subject. I'm sorry. No, this, cat this and the is squirrel, good. And they would, every morning they'd go up there and the squirrel would stand on the deck and the cat would be next to the squirrel and they wouldn't hurt each other and they were ready for their food every They're morning. <laughs> You're like Dr. Doolittle as well, like the animal protector. They just want to live like we do. Yeah. And they want yeah. To, yeah, so I kind of live by live, let live, and help live, so. Live, let live, and help live. And that's live. one thing that I've never got. I love animals so much, I've never gotten into painting animals. The only ones I've painted are my cats, you know. 
but I've never, huh. I've never painted animals. I don't know why, but it's, just never, it's mostly people that I yeah. paint. Huh? Yeah. Do you think that um, sourcing and, and finding, uh, like, the the objects and stuff that you were that in some ways is like a, a, a nod or respect back to your mother for that chair? Like, do you think that there's, like, a a – a touchback point for that, like the restoration that you do is sort of think uh, in some ways, I don't know, connected back to your, your mom's mission chair. It could be. I'm, I'm not, haven't really thought much about it. But, yeah. Uh, for me, when we restore furniture, I'm also creating. Of course. I'm yeah. creating the, an end product. And a lot of that stuff, uh, I had a guy who had this beautiful mission oak chair. Uh, table. That was a nice one. And you can see them; it's really thick and solid. Most of them are different planks put together and glued, and, they have, and with time they start splitting. Right. And this was a nice, solid oak, quarter sawn oak, mission oak table. But it was in like fourteen pieces or something. Like that. Oh my gosh! <laughs> and he had it in the porch. And I went there and I said, "What's up with that?" He said, "I'm throwing it away." I said, "You mind if I take it?" She said, "No, go ahead." So I took it. And I put that thing back together again. I showed it to him, and he wanted to buy it. <laughs> but guess what? I sold it to him. <laughs> That's awesome. I love the turnaround. I mean, it's such a – I just am so struck with, like, all of the, the different pieces, even with the animals, too. And, like, that that you're led by these passions and that you're – you tune in and observe things almost like a scientist would. Mm. You know, what does this do? How does this work? How do I challenge myself? How do I get to that next spot? Like it feels very um, scientific exploration, like discovery mm -hmm. or something. But it, it, it reminds you and, and keeps reminding you that you're a, you're a human being and you should care. We, we should care about what's in our earth, you know. Uh, God let us use. God is a proprietor. He he lets us use his, <laughs> this earth. And what are we going to do with it? Trash it? <laughs> so, but then I have a little a quick story too on the restoration. Uh, this, uh, this lady uh, asked me to restore uh, a sofa, an antique sofa, and uh, a day later or so after we picked it up, she said she called me and she said, you know, I I should have mentioned that. A long time ago, I, I lost my wedding ring. It was my, my husband gave it to me, and I love that ring, and we've never been able to find it, and I always th believed that it was behind that couch, but we looked for it, and we couldn't find it. I said, uh, if you find it, would you please return it? Wow. I said, sure. And uh, at that time, I had a guy who does all the gutting for me. You know, gutting means you take all the staples off, all the fabric, everything, oh. and then you rebuild it because that's what we do. Okay. So I told the guy, gut that thing for me. I said, whatever you find, put it in the baggie, put it on the side. He said, that's fine. I, I left, running around, doing stuff. And when I came back, you know, I, I looked at a little baggie, he had little coins and buttons and bottle caps and popcorn <laughs> there was, was a lot of stuff and a ring it was a ring and i said where did this come from he said it was in there i said oh, okay so i called the lady and like a bolt of white lightning she came to the shop crying and she said oh that's my ring that's my ring and she wanted to give me a hundred dollars reward i said no 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 that's your ring i said i don't need a hundred dollars so how joyful is that? That's pretty cool. Returning. Oh well, my gosh. The the other part of the story is she became my best advertisement. She told a lot of people and people says I got good referrals so they came to me. Wow. That's kind of works out pretty cool. I love it. <laughs> Welcome back. We're here with Juan Perez in on In the Act. Thanks, Juan. Thank you. This is really fun talking with you. I love um, uh, just you sharing about all of the explorations that you have and, and that there's such a kindness that you show towards um, or thoughtfulness or something um, towards people and humans and 
even the pieces that you make or restore, there there seems to be this imbued uh, kindness to things mm. and uh, attention to detail, and that that's really important to you. Um, and I love that. And I I wish we could show your paintings in our in our radio <laughs> broadcast, like. Oh, we can talk about it. <laughs> yeah. And so when your focus is primarily people, do you do like mostly like shoulders up? Do you do full scale mostly people? Mostly shoulders do you like up them? Right now. I've done some full, full, full body. Uh, I'm doing one full body of my wife now. It's going to go in our foyer. It's uh, wow. three feet by five feet high. Awesome. Uh, which is nice. Uh, and, and again, I use, I use oils. Oh, okay. And do they are they like sitting models or do you put them into spaces? No, it's hard for anybody to sit still for me because I it, it takes my process takes a long time. It's like six to eight, sometimes ten weeks. Wow, and, you know. But I wanted to mention something about when sure. when, I, when I say about setting my own standards, and I do that not just in painting, but pretty much in everything I do. In particular, restoration. There's instances where if I spent an hour, another hour. When you mentioned attention to detail, when when if I were to spend an, another hour or two or three or four hours on a particular piece, nobody would know. Sometimes not even care, but I do. Yeah, I know, and right. I care. Right. So I put that extra time, extra hour, because I know that's those are my standards. And some right. people have said, "Well, that looks good enough for me." It doesn't look good enough for me. I right. have to keep working at it, and I do. And then they say, "Oh, well, yeah, it's better," and that's because it, that's what drives me. My own standards drive me. And, yeah. And again, people may not recognize it. Sometimes not even care, but but I do. Yeah. So that's what brought me to that point. <laughs> yeah. And what you know, this is uh, an age old question, but how do you know when you're complete? How do you know when you're finished? Well, that's what I was trying to say earlier. Is you never do because I'm yeah. notorious for reworking stuff. Yeah, right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and my goal may be to paint this bike. Yeah. And I look at it a week later or two and says, I need to paint what's behind it too, or I need to make this a little lighter, a little darker. You know. Yeah. The color values need to change. Right. And one of the things I'm doing now and just starting now is that I'm starting to what I call just big goofy in painting, and that is that if people are, are flesh tone, I think I'm going to start painting them in blue and orange and green. You know, if if the sky is, is white, it's going to go red. It's going to go purple now. I just do something completely opposite than what we are used to and expect something to be. Right. Uh, Expectations are good, but sometimes they deter. Sometimes they compromise you. Sometimes right. they hold you back. Yeah. And I don't know what it is about me, but I don't like that. And when, when I was a mayor, uh, I had to with, withhold a lot. <laughs> I bet you did. <laughs> <laughs> you had to watch what you say and watch what you do. <laughs> yeah. Although a lot of times you got blamed if you didn't do it, and if you did, you got blamed for doing it. <laughs> right. And that's a that, – I mean, that's a position of – power and extreme expectations a lot of responsibility a lot of responsibility yeah and i i love that you tuned that into with the paintings like have that as a um analogy and so what is it about then changing the colors of the landscape or a person's skin tone um to those odd colors what do you hope will happen what is it? it? It just, for me, it's given me a different perspective um, on life, on, on, on what we have done and seen all these years, what we have been taught. You know, uh, I kind of remember vaguely when I was in junior high, the art teacher would say, that's not how you draw the, the hand. you got to draw it this way. That's not how you do this. But that's what I wanted to. That's how I wanted to draw it. But right. I was told that's not how you do it. Mm-hmm. So, if 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 people are supposed to be flesh tone, why can't they be purple? Yeah. Well, that's not the way it's supposed to be. I know, but I want to paint them purple. Right. <laughs> so I just want to kind of do it different. And and the other thing that I'm doing in in conjunction with that is, and it's kind of goofy too, is that as as human beings, we're we're very habitual. We, mm-hmm. We're very routine. Yes. We get up in the morning. We kind of go through the same routine. We don't realize it sometimes, but we do. 
mm-hmm. if you start thinking about it, all the things you do, you've been doing for years. Mm-hmm. I'm doing things differently. When I get up in the morning, I do everything backwards or the other way or this way. And yeah. my wife said, well, why are you doing it that way? You haven't done it that way. It's because I want to do it differently now. Right. And it's kind of disruptive and it kind of unorganized, but uh-huh. it's pretty cool. Yeah. I'm a firm believer in that. So I um, I think for me, I need a little bit more organization. So I try to have more habits <laughs> and more <laughs> ritual because I operate in a more chaotic way. So I read books about organization and like try and learn about structure for myself. And so it's funny to sit and have this conversation with you because, you know, like. <laughs> well, it doesn't mean I'm not organized because quite frankly, I am. You can walk oh, into my told- studio. I mean, you know, you have- web, everything's Absolutely. in place. I've got 300 and something or 400 something tubes of oil paint. I know where everyone is. And when I get done with it, I put it back. I totally when I, believe that. You know, when, when I want to look for, for burnt umber, I don't want to spend 30 minutes looking for it. Right. I know exactly where it's at. I believe that. You know, so I'm, my brushes, for example, they're, they're in a certain spot where, you know, where, where I can find them. When right. I, and that's, that's part of my organized weirdness, I guess. Right. But, but then that helps you be able to explore because you have all that structure and because you have that organization and your placement, it allows for you to then go spur of the moment. This is what I want to do this way. Mm-hmm. I'm changing it up this way because you can always go back to your structure. Right. You can be and do whatever, but you know exactly where that burnt umber mm-hmm. is. <laughs> so you can access things in a way that's easily, you know, easy for you, mm-hmm. which is great. It's I kind of picked up this goofy thing about me now from my wife because she uh, I love I love my wife but she, she says shows she, one of her things is when she looks through her purse she got a big purse right and <laughs> I don't know if it's a woman thing or what but she says I know where it's at I just can't find it yeah she'll put something in different places all the time I go up in a cupboard I'm looking for a can of this and oh I put it over there uh, well it wasn't over there before right and I'm thinking why can I do that I can I be a little odd to it and not not expect things to be that way all the time right so and i don't know how that's going to work out because i just started doing that so yeah maybe you'll see me pulling my hair out by myself and right. talking to myself in the corner <laughs> or something like that <laughs> i mean but that's like the 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 joy of experimentation and you've shown throughout your life that that's a part of this challenge for yourself i'm going to challenge myself what does this look like how can i make this if i'm drawn to this how do i make it work like you just have this drive to create and um, be excited about what you're creating. Mm. Yeah, true. Whether it's painting or whatever it is, your iterations of, of self, your expressions of mm. self. Uh, so you're you're do you paint on canvas or panel or I'm oil on uh, oil on wood. On wood? Yeah, mostly. I started out in ceramics um, with clay, and so using tools to like dig into clay, um, mm-hmm. uh, transferred into painting. I was so much more interested in the surfaces of clay, and um, the glazes, and um, and color, and texture, mm-hmm. and than I was form. And so abstract, yeah. Mm-hmm. And so uh, I. Uh, it just sort of led me into into painting. See, there, there's a good example. I threw that on purpose, abstract. People box you in into this, you know. And yeah. It could be whatever you could want it to be. It be sure. Whatever. But there's certain things. I mean, it's, it, you know, I guess to a certain extent you have to kind of follow the rules, whatever those rules may be, and whoever made those rules. Uh, I don't know, fall into a click or, you know, yeah. fall with the... The wave. I don't sure. Know. I don't know. Oh, I think there's, you know, sometimes I think that rules are just a way of organizing or to try and understand something. And then once you have that organization or the understanding for yourself, mm-hmm. you can break those and find your own rules. And I think that's the um, the takeaway that I get from most of the respected artists that I know and that I've read about is that, you know, they've incorporated and gathered information and then retool it for what works for them. Mm-hmm. And 
I do work in other mediums, but I still consider myself a painter. That's my organized, you know, that's the lens in which I see through things. But, uh, but I, I make glass pieces and wooden pieces and all of these other pieces, but they're still paintings to me. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I can't paint on canvas like you do. I can, but it really has to have a hard surface behind it. You use a palette knife? Um, I use uh, tools like carpentry tools and okay, yeah, sure. other things yeah. to like dig into and yeah. scrape off the paint. Right. And right. Um, I'm too rough with things. I'm I'm. Carpentry it's part of my mason person. tools. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah, <laughs> trowels. Exa I do. Yeah. yeah, it's one of my favorites. The cutters. And exactly. <laughs> whatever works for your texture, and you know, right. The, the, the whatever you want to create. Sure. Yeah. Sure. And there again, a lot of times, well, I was told you can't be using that. You have to, or you can't use a filbert. You have to use a round. You're like, why? Yeah. You know, and right. so. So I'm, I'm just I'm glad you you mentioned that because uh, that that's the artist. It's whatever yes. works. To create what you want to create, that's what you use. Yeah. And some people might try to restrict you. Oh, I wouldn't be using that. That's not very arty. Yeah, right. <laughs> a trowel. Right, I know. <laughs> well, it spreads the paint better, I too. mean, I go to hardware stores for yeah. my tools, basically. Yeah. <laughs> but I think it's really important that, um, this is for our listeners to, to hear that you have um, made your life as an artist, not just as in the fine arts, but your art as a human, as a being on this earth from your early life to now is like creating all of these. It was not linear and you got to, you know, find yourself through those and support yourself and have um, a partner that supported and loved you back too. And so it's just a, Beautiful expression. Yeah, my wife has been with me all along, I'll tell you. <laughs> Sometimes I wonder why. <laughs> We've been married 46 years. Well, that's amazing. Yeah. So That painting been, of her sounds haul, really beautiful. Know, so. <laughs> and what would you, if you could give, like, advice to people who are maybe not lost, but... Um, trying to find their way or in a place where it doesn't feel like it's them or uh, what they're doing doesn't seem right for them? I guess the, the way I've, I've lived my life is if it doesn't seem right, if it's not them or they're not being accepted, hmm, big deal. Don't worry about it. Accept <laughs> yourself. Because <laughs> in the end, it's what you believe of yourself that really truly matters. Uh, if if you start fashioning your life based on what others think of you and what others want you to be, you're not you. Yeah. You have to be you. And it's cliche, I know that, and I know it's people call it BS, but and it may be hard for people to do, some people to do, and may be easy for other people to do. I. Uh, you have to care, but, I mean, in a way that you still can go in your own direction. You can still follow your passion. You can still follow your heart. And, yeah. and there again, not just a physical heart, but just what you believe in. And it's hard because there's not a lot of them out there. Sometimes it's lonely. Yeah. <laughs> Being that. <laughs> it is. So. And how do you how do you get through those spaces when you're lonely? That's a human question. <laughs> yeah. Well, for me, I mean, and again, it's been part of my life as growing up as a kid i didn't i didn't have a lot of friends because yeah. i was poor and i lived uh, what they call the bajillo the bajillo would be the the down the bottom of the, of the city el alto was a high so the people with money lived in the alto and the poor people lived in the bajillo and that's where i lived so i didn't have a lot of friends i mean it was just 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 the way it was and i accepted that i mean i found i found pleasure and happiness and being alone and drawing my little sketches on my my paper sacks and all that uh, as you get older yeah there's you know like you have the certain needs you need friends you need this you need acceptance and all that and that kind of works its way in but every everybody's different you know yeah. we all handle it differently if, yeah if we all if, if there was a, a cookie cutter method 
it'd be great, but there isn't. So you know? true. We all react differently to us. You know, so you could tell somebody a bad word and they'll sit there and cry for three hours. You can tell another person a bad word. He's going to laugh at you and move on. Right. You know, we all handle different. Right. It's a great point. Yeah. yeah. Just source from yourself what you think you need. You yeah. know, what I was going to say that, that when you talked about earlier at the beginning that people show their creativity in different ways. Um, I really believe that. I mean, even, even a, a gardener, has creativity and how they set up their gardens or, 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 or a, a seamstress or, Absolutely. Or, or somebody that bakes cakes. I've yeah. seen some of these cakes are just phenomenal. Yeah. I can't believe they're cakes. Right. And they create them so they can be eaten. Yeah. I mean, they're, once they're eaten, that art is gone. You never see it again. Right, right, right. But they do that and, and they're creating and that's their passion. And, and some of the stuff just... I'm in awe. I mean, how, how do they do this? You know, you know, when we were in, in in Europe, we saw these cathedrals with these massive columns of marble columns. You know, like yeah, thirty columns and massive buildings and all architecturally beautiful. Those people put a lot of heart into that. And yeah, you can still enjoy them. Right. Uh, I mean, just 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 so much out there. And a lot of times we don't pay attention. Sometimes we do. But, yeah. Uh, sometimes the people that are being creative aren't really aware of it either. But there's yeah. a lot of creativity out there. Absolutely. E- even with kids. <laughs> Absolutely, one of my favorites. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yeah. So, but it's uh, been nice talking to you, and I enjoyed it. And happy Thanksgiving to you and Thank your family. You. Thank you. Thank you so much for being uh, with us and talking with us today, Juan. You're much welcome. In the Act is produced in the studios at Mead Public Library in Sheboygan, Wisconsin. More information on the web at meadpl.org.